Please just have a seat in God's presence. Good morning, church. It's always a privilege to share, to stand before you and to share God's word. I will never take it for granted. It is um, Pastor Sheon, Pastor Dawkins. I really, really appreciate this privilege to share what God has in mind with his people on a Sunday like this. I'm grateful. I don't take it for granted. On days like this are the days when I remember that I have ties and I have jackets and then I put them on and wear them to church because um, it, it, it's always a privilege to share with you people again. Um, so this morning, I'll be sharing something very interesting and I'm trusting that the Lord will use this to speak to someone today and the topic we'll be talking on is the roots of bitterness. The roots of bitterness. How many of us, when we heard this, uh, you probably thought, hmm, this is going to be interesting. I know someone who has experienced this or someone who has been bitter, and I wish they are listening. How many of us felt that way? Or how many of us, as I thought about this, we remembered our experiences that gave us, uh, left a bitter taste in our mouth, as I mentioned this. How many of us are here that had that? Oh, yeah. I mean, bitterness is not something that is new. We all know what bitterness is. We all know how it affects people. But I'm trusting God this morning that the Lord himself will give us insights to what he wants us to understand so that we can see the impact of bitterness and what implication it could have on our lives. And I'll just share a quick story with us. So as I was preparing for this message, I read a story about a man. So there was this man uh, in ancient Germany, in olden days Germany. So he got beaten by a dog, and apparently the dog had rabies. And that period, they had no drug for curing rabies. There was nothing they could do. So they took him to the hospital, and the doctor saw him, and the doctor said, my friend, I will not give you any false hope. There is nothing I can do for you. The best we will do is to comfort you and make your end a lot easier. So what I would advise you to do is get your affairs in order. And so the first thing the guy did was that he got really, really depressed and sad because he was wondering, now the end has come. Then the next thing he remembered was he now requested and said, can I have a piece of paper and a pen? And so they brought it to him. The doctor thought hmm, he was writing his will. So they gave him the piece of paper and then he wrote. The doctor came back an hour after and saw that he was still writing. And he said, wow, you really took my instructions to heart. You're writing. You're writing your will, right? And the guy looked up and said, writing my will? No. I'm writing the list of people I'm going to buy it immediately I leave here. <laughs> That's how bitterness is. We are always looking for people. Bitterness is something that bites us. And then we look for people who it will snap at to bite. And that's what the scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews. This will be our anchor verse. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 15. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any brutes of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It says we should look diligently, lest any one of us. So that means there's a possibility that we could fail of the grace of God. And then there could be roots of bitterness that will spring up within us and defile others. So just give me some minutes to break this down and give us a proper perspective of what the Hebrew writer was talking about here. The first thing we see he was talking about here is around looking diligently. What he's telling us here is that we have to be careful. We have to pay constant attention, consistent attention to this so that we don't fall short of the grace of God. What this implies is there is a possibility that as Christians, we could fall short of the grace of God. That means the grace of God is available for us, but it's not working in our lives. Why? It's because we are not paying attention to this. And so the Hebrew writer is given a warning to say there is a possibility 
and as believers, because grace is available for us to help us to walk, to help us to walk worthy of him. But there is a possibility that we could fall short of that grace. Why? He goes on to say, because of the roots of bitterness springing up within us. The implication of this is that bitterness could be one of those things that could prevent the grace of God from being able to work for us. And that's what he's saying. If you look at the original Greek, the original word in the Greek um, version went for bitterness. What was written there is synonymous to what we call poison today. And so what this implies is that the Greek writer is admonishing us to say bitterness is a poison that could affect our work with God. It could grow up and spring up within us. And so we have to be careful because it really much is tantamount to us taking up cyanide and ingesting it and living with it. That is what bitterness is like. And the next thing he says is, he says, looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. That means bitterness could trouble us. And if we look at what the original Greek says here, it means to annoy or to vex. And this was something that when, um, in the time of Jesus Christ, when he was healing the sick, when he was healing those who were troubled by the demons. This was the same word that was used in those times. The scripture tells us in the book of Luke, it says that, and they that were vexed with unclean spirits. If we look at 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14, we see a similar instance with Saul, the king. Saul, when he had, issue, when he had disobeyed the Lord, and then this, an evil spirit came upon him. The Bible tells us that but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So what this means is that bitterness would actually act just the same way evil spirits would trouble people who are possessed by them. And so it's as bad as that because it could create in us an excessive mental and emotional turmoil. That's what bitterness does to us. And it looks like those who are experiencing it, they are possessed by evil spirits. That's what the Hebrew writer is trying to tell us here. That we should be careful lest any roots of bitterness would spring upon us. And then it troubles us. And not just troubling us, it defiles others. We all know how bitterness can ravage, go around people. You would see someone who you know, this person is quite toxic. I don't want to come close to them. Why? Because you know that their vibe can be transmitted to you. That's what bitterness is. That's what he's saying here, that you could become defiled by someone who is experiencing bitterness. That's why nobody wants to be around someone who is bitter. I mean... I, you, we know of countless examples of people who went through terrible relationships. And then, you know what usually happens to the next person they meet? <laughs> they put the brunt of everything, of their past experience, on that person. That's what bitterness is. That's how it could go transmitting itself to other people. It's like a virus. It's contagious. It can go from one person to the other. This morning, I had to crave your indulgence, right, to be a bit vulnerable. And I'll share some personal stories of my experience with bitterness. I grew up in a, an intertribal family. What, is, what that means is that, okay, my, my father was from a different tribe from my mother in Nigeria, back in Nigeria. And so my, my, my father's folks did not like my mom because she was from a different tribe. And so it was a general issue when you have people marrying from different ethnic groups. And so they made it known that they did not like her. And because of that, she suffered some very bitter and hurtful experiences. That even after she had grown up, after I'd gotten married, everybody who comes around her, even my wife, she would narrate the stories and experiences that she had had. 
that everybody knew what she went through. We thought, well, as she was just telling us so that we could know where we were coming from. But what I found out growing up was that she was passing across her worldview to us. And so by implication, what now happened was that I ended up not having a relationship with my uncles and my aunties from my father's side. Why? Because of my mother's experience. Bless her heart, that wasn't what she wanted to do. That wasn't her heart desire. She was just trying to let us know that this is where I'm coming from. This was my past. But what ended up happening was she ended up passing across the bitterness she was carrying. That's your today. It's a lot difficult for me to relate with my uncles and my aunts from my father's side because of her beating. That's how bitterness can be contagious. Please don't get me wrong. My mom is a lovely woman. She's really nice and all that. But that experience she passed on unconsciously affected my relationship with other people, affected the relationship with my siblings because we knew what she had gone through. That's how bitterness is. Many of us have had experiences that has hurt us deeply. We've gone through things or relationships where we've been cheated. And then you look back and you say, I don't deserve this. This is not something I should have experienced. And then we go around carrying this heart. We carry these experiences. We carry this abuse we've experienced. And it becomes a part of us and begins to shape us. This morning I've come to tell you that you don't have to carry this everywhere with you. I know this because I myself have experienced it. I have had my fair share of bitterness. I was sharing with uh, Grandma Cindy during the week about my experience with bitterness. And it's something I would like to share with us. So, while I was um, much younger, I was was in school. In my um, high school days, we call it secondary school back in Nigeria. It's high school here. In my high school days, I was the youngest in my class. And so everybody knew because I had a smaller stature than most of the guys, and they knew that I was young. And so I was subject to bullying. They would bully me. There was, I remember an experience. We had what we called boarding house, a residential school. And one night, I had, a, I had a, an altercation with a senior. And he dragged me from a third bunk, dragged me down, and I fell with my chest to the ground. And I had serious chest pain from that period onwards. Because of those level of bullying I had experienced, I told myself this must never happen to me again. So when I got to the university, I was much younger still, because I had a very fast education. So I got to the university, I prepped myself, and I told myself this will never happen again. And so I developed a philosophy that was called, it is better to be feared than to be loved. And so everywhere I was, I became unapproachable. I was fearsome in my look. I was always frowning. This me you see now. This is not me you know then. (laughs) Then I was very fearsome. Most of my friends, they they, they were guys who, most of my colleagues then back in school, they were people who were friendly. And when we go together, we were working together, and people are greeting, I just walk past because I was trying to build my defenses. And I became addicted to being constantly angry. Yeah. My friend asked me one period and said, why are you always angry? I said, this is the best way I function. I have to be angry for me to function. And so it became a part of me that I would wake up in the morning and I would just be angry for no just cause. That became a lifestyle because of the hot I had experienced. I was trying to make myself hear some. I was trying to create a front, a defense to prevent people from being able to bully me. But what ended up happening was that I was building a monster inside of me. And even when I got married, it became an issue with my, my folks. Because then, I could not love people. You can't, you can't be an angry man and be loving people. It was difficult. Yeah, I love my wife, but I could just wake up in the morning and for no just cause, I would be angry with my wife. And for no just cause, I would be angry with my children. Because I built that. There was an undercurrent inside of me that had happened because of a past experience. And so, people who showed me affection, 
People who show me love were the ones who bore the brunt of what had happened to me. Because I was so bitter, I was so angry, that even when I experienced love from my children, it irritated me. It was so bad that it was affecting my relationship and I made those who loved me suffer because of what had happened in my past. The truth is, this went on for a long time. Even when I became, when I gave my life to Christ and I had become a pastor, it was still very difficult to get through from this. And because you cannot love in anger. It does, it's not compatible. And I'll pray to God and say, God, help me. This is not how I should be. I cannot just wake up in the morning and be feeling so angry. That's not the lifestyle. That's not how someone should live. But it was difficult for me to get through this. And then it looked like the grace of God was not sufficient for me. So every time, I would always, I was, it was difficult for me to live that life that God wanted me to live. Because of bitterness. And that was what the Hebrew writer was telling us, that we, it is possible for us to fall short of the grace of God if we allow bitterness to reign in our lives. And so for me, it felt like God wasn't answering my prayers and I was constantly falling short of the grace that he made available for me to work consistently with him until God opened my eyes and made me see that I had built a stronghold in my life because of an experience I had when I was in the secondary school, when I was in the high school. And so it was like until I saw that there was a torrent of bitterness, a volcanic eruption that is waiting to explode. And until I address that, nothing will change. Until I fix that, nothing changed. It's a similar experience some of us might be having here today. Maybe you're listening to me online, listening to me at home, and you say, this sounds like something I had. I'm here to tell you that I got free. And if I could be free, then you can be free as well. And the grace that was available to make me free is available for you today in the name of Jesus. We will have three perspectives that we'll consider today to tell us how, what bitterness is like. How can we identify it in our lives and how can we be free? The first perspective would be about defining bitterness and identifying its, its seeds. We look at bitterness and really understand what it is. So, because you cannot solve a problem until you understand what that problem is, right? Then the second perspective we'll be looking at is we'll look at biblical examples of people who experience bitterness and what their ends were. So we look at, few, look at a few examples of people who, in the Bible, had a similar experience as this, who were bitter, and what was the effect that it had on their lives and people around them. And finally, we're looking at dealing with the roots of bitterness and getting free. So how do we get free from the stronghold? So the first perspective, dealing, defining bitterness and identifying its seeds. Bitterness, I can simply define bitterness to be unresolved anger that has festered and allowed to stick around. Unresolved anger that has festered and you've allowed it to stick around with you. That's what bitterness is. And that's why Paul, in the book of Ephesians, when he was writing to the Ephesians, he was warning them and told them in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 26, he says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Why is he telling them this? He was telling them this because the Holy Spirit knows that when anger becomes festered, when you allow your anger to wait till the next day, it will become bitterness. And so the Holy Spirit was telling us that it, this thing will affect your work with me. It will poison you. So you must make sure that you are not angry. Yet you can be angry. But do not sin by allowing it to fester 
upon you. Don't let the sun go down upon you. So if you're angry, make sure that this anger is resolved before you go to bed. Because when it becomes, when it goes beyond one day, when it goes beyond a certain period, it will turn into a monster that you will not be able to deal with. Bitterness is a poison that comes when one has been beaten by certain things in life. It leaves you beaten and it makes you channel your energy into snapping at other people. Just like the instance I gave us about that man who was beaten by the dog. And the next thing we had to do was to keep biting people who had offended him. That's what beatiness does to us. It leaves us beaten, and then we go after other people. There is no passion of the human heart that promises so much and gives so little. I remember when someone hurt me, and I will sit back. I, I remember that particular instance. There was this guy when I was in secondary school. He was a lot taller than I was. So that day, I was just walking on, and I can't remember what exactly happened, but what I remembered was that he gave me a dirty slap. That day, I felt really embarrassed because he was in front of everybody. And he slapped me. But because he was bigger than I was, I couldn't do nothing. But I went back home and I stewed on it. This is how I'm going to destroy this guy. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to... I will make sure I'm able to find something to injure this guy. I stewed on it. It felt like he was promising me so much. But of course, there was nothing I could do about it except hurt myself. That is what bitterness is about. It is one great emotion, one terrible emotion that will help you to stew up. It will promise you that, yes, this is what you can do. But at the end of the day, it will deliver very little, except hurt you. And that's what bitterness is. That's why the scripture tells us to pay earnest diligence to it and to make sure we can get rid of it so that it doesn't spring up inside of us and begin to eat us from inside out. Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's because the Holy Spirit knows that bitterness is a dangerous thing. So he wants us to put it away. We cannot be consuming poison and expect to live a healthy life. No. And so we have to get rid of it. So bitterness is one emotion that has profound imports on the life of the individual manifesting it and those around it. So now that we've defined what bitterness is, how do we begin to identify when bitterness is coming into someone's life? Now, I know I mentioned that bitterness is anger that is left to fester, right? But the truth is, anger is not the source of bitterness. Anger is just a gardener that allows the seeds of bitterness to grow into what it is, into bitterness. Because there are some seeds that must be planted first. And what anger simply does is anger just makes them, anger just nourishes them, it grooms them, it makes them blossom into bitterness. And what are those seeds? Those things are the major things that happens to us and the result in us being angry and then we begin to experience bitterness. The first one of them is fear. Fear is one emotion that we feel that if, when we feel fear, it could result, it could trigger anger for us. I remember an experience I had back in Nigeria. My younger brother was living with me, so um, I gave him my car to take my dad out for something. So he took my dad to the hospital and then dropped my dad at the hospital. And then he went away with the car. Yes. My dad finished the appointment in the hospital and we were looking for my brother. He was not around to pick my dad home, so my dad had to take an Uber back home. So I started calling him to say, where's this boy? He didn't take my call. And so I became afraid that I hope they have not kidnapped him because, you know, sometimes in Nigeria, <laughs> security could be... So I was very scared because I was calling him and he wasn't taking my calls. He left the house around 11 and this was past 7 
in the night. I was calling him. And it had rained that day. And you know how Lagos could be when it rains and it could be flooded around. So I felt that. I hope nothing was wrong. So I became very agitated looking for this guy. I drove around Lagos looking for him. Late at night, around 11 o'clock, looking for my brother to say, where is this boy? And then he appeared at home around past 11. You can imagine how angry I was. Because I was, I was scared at first. I started calling people. I was calling my pastor to say, please help me pray. I don't know what has happened to this boy. Because I was calling him. His number was switched off. So it was fear I felt at first. And then I became very angry. And then I told him, you must never touch my car again. <laughs> because I was angry. That was the seed that led to the anger. And if I allowed it to fester, to turn into bitterness. That's the first seed. The second seed we see is frustration. Frustration. I also remember, I have lots of experiences with bitterness, so I'll tell you. So, <laughs> oh yeah. So back in school, back, I was in, back in Nigeria, I, had, um, I was working in a place and I was doing very well. Initially, I got promoted, was excelling, and then because of how well I was doing, they had identified me that, ah, this guy, he's one of the best performers in this, in this team. So when they moved our boss to a higher role, she, took, she said she was going to take me with her. And so the person who was going to take over for my boss now said, no, you can't take this guy. He's a performer for me. So I can't allow you to take him with him. So she did all that she could to make sure that I don't move with my boss. And... To move with my boss was going to be a great opportunity. I was going to earn in dollars because it was a foreign assignment. I was going to move outside Nigeria and be earning my salary and also earning allowances in dollars. So it was going to be a life-changing experience. But this was someone who was standing in my way and preventing it from happening. And then, aside from that, because of how frustrated I was with that experience, I wasn't giving as much as I was before. So, because, I mean, I, I was going to be earning money that would change the life of my family. And then you sat down there and said, because I was a performer, that you won't allow me to go. And so I dropped my performance. I wasn't, I wasn't performing anymore. So, see, so, when it was time for promotion, I wasn't promoted. I was like, double trouble. Like we say in Nigeria, double wahala. So, I was experiencing frustration on the fact that this was an opportunity for me that couldn't come to me, you prevented me, and then you're still not promoting me. So it became so bad that I also, so of course, I took that home. I was dealing with my people at home with the same anger <laughs> and the frustration. But the Lord has delivered me. So, <laughs> so that is what frustration, frustration is one of those triggers that could result in anger and then Result in bitterness. The Lord, it took a while for me to forgive that woman. Yeah, it wasn't just one. There were two of them, actually. It took a while for me to forgive them. Because how can you go behind and go and block my way because you wanted me to work in your team? Please, let me progress. But <laughs> well, that's another story. Then the third seed we have is hurt. And this could be physical, emotional, of verbal hurt. A lot of us have experienced hurt where people have hurt us through the words that they say. And then we'll steal over this and become angry. And then it will affect us. I'm saying to us today that anger is not the source of bitterness. These three things fear. Frustration and hurt are the three seeds that could instigate bitterness for us. And it's something we must pay attention to. So we move to the next perspective. People who experienced bitterness and their end. I've shared my experience, right? But I would like to share experiences in the Bible so that we can see people who had a similar experience and what happened to them. The first experience I'll talk about is Aitofel. How many of us know the story of Aitofel? Aitofel. Okay, so I'll tell us. Now, Aitofel was 
a counselor to David the king. He was someone who David trusted so much. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 16 and in verse 23, the Bible says, And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as a man had inquired at the oracle of God. What does this mean? It means that when Ahithophel gives a counsel, you will feel that you are getting a counsel from where it felt like it was the Holy Spirit speaking to you. He was that blessed with wisdom. This was a man who, the scripture told us that he felt like a man was inquiring from the Holy Spirit, was listening to the oracle of God speaking. He was that blessed. That was who Ahithophel is. And he was a counselor to David. But something happened to him that changed his perspective, that changed the way he was relating with David in such a way that he became a rebel to David. And when David needed him the most, he turned against him. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, from verse 12, and Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor, from his city, even from Gilead, where he offered sacrifices and the conspiracy was strong. So let's step back a bit and then we remember, let's talk about what happened here. Absalom was the son of David. We'll talk about him much later. And he had rebelled against his father. He was living, leading a rebellion. And the first person he called for was Haithophel, who was David's counselor. Why? Why did Absalom call on this man who is the oracle of God? Why? Something happened. I'll tell you what. How many of us knew that Bathsheba was the granddaughter of Ahithophel? Oh, yeah. She was his granddaughter. In the book of 1st, 2nd Samuel, Chapter 11, verse 3. And David sent and inquired from the woman and said, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So, we see here that Bathsheba was the daughter of Elam, right? Second Samuel, chapter 23, in verse 34. Eliphaz, Elf. Fethlet, sorry, the son of Ahibas, Ahasba. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this, this very well. The Makatite, Elam, the son of Elam, the son of Ahitophel, the Gileonite. In the previous verse we read, we saw that Elam was the father of. Bathsheba, and Elam is the son of Ahithophel. So, Ahithophel was the grandfather to Bathsheba. And then Ahithophel was the counselor to David, right? So he knew, what, he knew who David was. But do we know what happened between David, Bathsheba, and Uriah? David, for those who don't know, let me just quickly give a, a quick synopsis. David was supposed to go to war. And by that day, he got tired. I said he wasn't going to go to war. So he went on the rooftop of his house, and he saw a beautiful woman bathing. And he couldn't resist the temptation, and then he slept with the woman. Afterwards, the woman got pregnant, and instead of him owning up to the evil he had done, he decided to cover it up. And he called for Uriah, the husband of the woman, to come back from where he was fighting the war so he could take ownership of the child. But Uriah was a righteous man and he was a very just person and said he wasn't going to do this. And so he did not do it. And what did David do? David schemed to have Uriah killed. And so when Uriah was killed, of course, Ahithophel will be there to mourn with his granddaughter. And so you can imagine someone who was a chief in David's court coming and mourning that, oh, my granddaughter has lost her husband. Then he later found out in the grapevine 
that David was, had an affair with his granddaughter. And not just had an affair, he was also consp- he conspired to kill the son, the, the grandson, the, the husband to the. So you can imagine how irritated he must have felt. How he felt that this man, who is meant to be the anointed of God, would do this evil against my family and against Israel. That turned his head. And then he was waiting for an opportunity to make sure that he would deal with David. That how could you do this? Well, because David was the king, he couldn't rise up to him and beat him immediately or do something. But he was beating his time. And when the opportunity came, when Absalom rebelled, the first person he called was Ahithophel. I dare say that. This is my own, own interpretation now. I dare say that Ahithophel and Absalom cooked up the conspiracy together because of what had happened. Because how could he have known that this was a guy that I could use for my rebellion? That was what bitterness did to him. And so aside from this, when he had found out this, and what he decided to do was, I was going to deal with David. And the first thing he did to disgrace David was to make sure Absalom slept with his father's wives. Why? I thought about that to see why did he decide to do that? In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 16 in verse 20. 2 Samuel 16 verse 20. So Absalom now said to Ahithophel, give counsel among you what we should do. And Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go in unto your father's concubines, that you may lay that I has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that thou art abhorred by their fa- thy father, and, shall, and then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread a tent for Absalom on the top of the house, and he went into his father's concubines. Why did he ask him to do that? Oh, David, you slept with my granddaughter, your son will sleep with your wives. He wanted to disgrace David because of the bitterness of his heart. That's how bitterness could be very, very deadly. So the next thing he did, he didn't stop there. So he had disgraced David in front of the whole of Israel, made him a worthless king. The next thing he did was to plan based on David's weakness, because she knew David very well. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 1, it says, And moreover, Ahithophel said to, Abra- to Absalom, Let me now choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. And I will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed. He knew David inside out. He was going to leverage on his weaknesses. His friend, someone who was his friend before. He wanted to make sure he destroyed him. And so he said, and I will make him afraid and all the people that are with him shall flee and I will smite the king only. And I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is all, if all returned. So all the people shall be in peace. And the same pleased Absalom well and all the elders of the people. Because he knew David's weakness. He was going to leverage on The only thing that saved David at this point was the prayer that David had prayed. Because David had prayed to God and said, God, please turn his counsel. I know how wise this guy. He knows my inside out. That was the only thing that saved David. And when, and so, because of the prayers of David, the counsel of Ahithophel was rejected. To show how bitter he was, after his counsel was rejected, he had, his option was, is either David is destroyed or I die. So bitterness had eaten up into him that he could not resist but to make sure that either David is destroyed or he dies. And that was what happened in verse 23. And when Absalom saw, and Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose I got him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order and hung himself and died. 
bitterness consumed him till the very end, that he killed himself. You look at the next example, Absalom. Absalom was the third son of David. He was the third son David had. He was the one who led this rebellion we had talked about. But how did that rebellion start? It started from bitterness as well. What happened to Absalom? Second Samuel chapter 13, in verse 1 to verse 5. And it came to pass that Absalom the son of David, I'm sorry, Absalom the son of David had a fair sister whose name was Selma, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister, Thelma, before she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it was hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemel, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said to him, Why art thou, being the king's son, leaned from day to day? Was thou not tell me? And Amnon said to him, I love Thelma, my brother's sister. And then Jonadab said to him, Lay thee down on the bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Thelma come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my side, that I may see it, and it at her hand. Long story short, he ended up defiling his sister. He did what his friend had told him, and then he defiled his sister. Now, after he did that, the anger he felt towards her was greater than the infatuation he had for her. And so he threw her out. So he threw her out. After he had done that in despicable thing to his sister, Absalom heard about it. In verse 20, it says, And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Had Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He's your brother. Regard not this thing. So Thelma remained desolate in her brother's um, in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard all these things, he was wrought. And Absalom spoke unto his brother, Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had first his sister, Thelma. I dare say to you that it wasn't just Amnon alone he hated. He hated David as well. Because he felt, how could my father have heard this? And not do anything. Because Amnon was his first son. And so David was felt he was angry, but couldn't do anything to his first son because he felt he was going to be the heir to his throne. And so Absalom was very bitter. And so he began to plan. If you go through the scripture, you see that the first person who went to meet about the feast he was planning was David. He planned to kill not just Amnon alone. He wanted to kill David too. But it didn't happen. And so what he finally did was that he killed his brother, Amnon, out of anger. In verse 28, Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Mark you now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, smite Amnon, and then kill him. Fear not, have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. He did not stop there. After he had killed his brother, he proceeded to pl plan B, the second plan, which was to deal with his father for the fact that he didn't do anything about his brother. The bitterness he had ate him up until he was destroyed. That's how bitterness is. That's how much of an evil it is. These two examples we see shows us the destructive influence of bitterness. It doesn't only affect those who are touched by it. It affects everyone around it. And history is replete. History tells us of people where people have burned down nations because of bitterness. People have murdered babies because of bitterness. We've seen stories in history. We can look back at examples of people who, because of bitterness, has made the destruction to entire civilizations and people because of bitterness. That's why the scripture wants us to make sure that we get rid of this evil. Now, how do we begin to deal 
with the roots of bitterness. I need to begin to tie up. My, my time is really running out. Now, how do we begin to deal with the roots of bitterness and then how do we get free? Number one, you must identify the root cause. You must know what cursed it. You will never be able to fix a problem until you identify what is at the root of the problem. You can't focus on the appearance of the problem. That was what I was doing when I was praying to God and praying about the anger I was feeling. I was focusing on the appearance. But there was a root beyond it. Just like you have a big tree and you're trying to bring down the tree and you're cutting on the branches, on the fruits. The tree will remain there. Nothing would happen. But until you go to the roots and then you identify what the problem is, how did this start? You have to identify the seed that caused it. Was it the hurt that you felt? Was it a fear that you had experienced? Or was it a frustration that had resulted into what it is? You must get to the root of the matter. Number two, once you have identified the cause, then you have to pray about it. See, bitterness is a stronghold. I must tell you, I experienced it and so I know. Bitterness is a stronghold. It wasn't built in one day. It's layered over time. And so for you to bring it down, not mere words will bring it down. There has to be the place of prayer. That's why the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Bitterness as a stronghold is something that prayers will help you bring down. You must bring that hurt that we experience and we bring it to the feet of the Father. And we tell him about the hurt that this is what happened to me. And that was what I did. I had to bring down the hurt. The guy, what happened to me when I was in the boarding house? The guys who slapped me, I brought down all those hearts and I had to tell the Lord, say, Lord, remove this seed, the seed of hearts that had caused this bitterness. Until you are able, and it's not something that you just wish away and say, no, I forgive them. Or I, no, there has to be a place of prayer. You have to take time to pray. And finally, you must choose to forgive you must choose to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice you must make. And the first person you must forgive is yourself. You know why? Because you've been ingesting poison all this while. Bitterness is self-harm. And so you have to forgive yourself first for ingesting poison all this while. You have to take yourself and forgive yourself. And then you forgive the person who has hurt you? You must choose to forgive the one who caused the harm, the hurt, the frustration, and the fear that, you, that resulted in the bitterness you begin to feel. By God's grace, I hope that next time, the next coming days, we'll be able to sp spend more time to look at why we must forgive, what the role of forgiveness is to help us get free. But we will never be free until we identify the cause, until we take it in the place of prayer, and then we choose to forgive, and we truly forgive. I pray that the Lord will help us, that he would help us to get rid of this evil called bitterness. As I begin to round off, bitterness is a poison. And harboring it is self-harm. If we keep remaining bitter, I know that for some of us, some of our experiences, if you told anybody, to feel so sorry. We would probably even want to take the bitterness from you and begin to feel like you feel. But the truth is, today is the day to lay down those burdens. Matthew chapter 11, the Lord was telling us that he says that Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. You've carried this load for a long time. Now it's time for you to lay it down at the feet of the Savior. Now it's time for you to lay down this hurt. 
this bitterness that has occupied your heart. Now it's time to lay it at the feet of the Father. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am weak and lonely. I have suffered what you have experienced. I have been through wars. The people I created, they beat me, they hung me on the tree, they called me names, they hurt me so much. Learn from me. And that's what the master is asking us this morning. Let's bow our hearts. And let's pray to the Lord. The power that liberated me from the stronghold of bitterness is here today to set you free. If you're willing, are you willing this morning? Would you be made free? Would you be delivered from the power of bitterness? Bitterness is a strong evil root that the scripture tells us to make sure that we are not caught up in it so that we don't begin to feel that the grace of God is not working for us. This morning, if you have experienced bitterness and you want to be free, speak to the Father. Identify the heart that you, that the thing that caused the bitterness and then speak to the Father about it. Speak to the Father about it. Tell him what has happened. Tell him to heal you. Ask him to show you mercy. And then begin to forgive yourself. And forgive that person who had hurt you. I'll give you some time to, say, to pray to the Lord yourself and then speak to the Lord. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your power that is able to save us and to deliver us from every stronghold of the enemy. We thank you because the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same power that liberated me from the stronghold of bitterness and has held me down for years on end, is also available today to liberate your children. Is there anyone here that is experiencing the root of bitterness, where bitterness has erected itself as a stronghold? Lord, I stand as your oracle this morning, and I declare freedom for such in the name of Jesus. Because your word says that the entrance of your word brings light, and it brings understanding, and we are able to see where things are going wrong for us. Your word has come to us this morning. And dear Father, we ask for your help. We ask that you heal every broken heart. You ask that you heal every bitter heart. As we identify the causes of this thing, we ask for your healing power, that you heal us from every hurt. You heal us from every fear. You heal us from everything that has frustrated us, that has resulted into this bitterness. And we ask, O oh Lord, for you to help us to forgive. To forgive ourselves and to forgive those who have hurt us. Lord, set us free from the power of this, of this stronghold in the name of Jesus. Lord, we receive your help this morning. And you set us free in the name of Jesus. Thank you because you've heard and answered. For in Jesus' name, we're afraid. Amen.